My name is Dr. Caitlin Kite, and I want to talk a little bit about different styles of doctoral supervision. So why is this even an important thing to think about? Well, the quality of doctoral supervision is something that really can predict how fast students progress, whether they progress, and whether they can graduate at all. It's really essential to have a good supervisory relationship, whatever good looks like for a particular supervisor and a particular student, in order to support a student through the doctoral process. Supervision used to be thought of just an adjunct to what other uh, activities you had as a researcher, uh, and as a lecturer in a, in a higher education institution, but now it's increasingly been realized that supervision actually is a form of teaching. And in fact, it's a really important and very complex form of teaching. And this is why it's important for supervisors to get training and to have some awareness of the peculiarities of supervision. So they aren't just tossed into it, trying to think about it as uh, a form of lecturing or a form of mentoring or a form of managing, because actually it might be all of those things and even more. And there are some very specific bespoke things to think about when you're working with a doctoral student. And that's why it's really important, I think, to understand that there are a range of approaches that you might need to take over the course of a PhD, over the course of working with different students, uh, over the course of working in different disciplines and different institutions, there are all sorts of things that impact what a particular doctoral journey will look like and what people will need within that context. And so it's good to think about what sorts of things that we see out in the world, not just the things that come naturally to you, uh, because those are great, but you won't have been exposed to everything. So what else is happening out there that you might be able to draw on that can inform some of the decisions that you make? It's also important to realize that the world in which supervision is currently occurring is not the same world in which most current supervisors went through their own doctoral program. And I can say this with confidence because things have been changing so recently in the last few years. And this is certainly true of the last few decades, where we have people who are currently supervisors who got their PhDs 20, 30, 40 years ago, and it's a completely different world since then. And that is because of these words up here in purple, formalization, growth and diversification of the candidate population, diversification of study modes, and diversification of study purposes. So if there's really any word here that encapsulates what's changed about the doctoral world, it really is diversity. So in terms of formalization, we do see that institutions are now much more rigorous about how things are done and having a bureaucratic process and having consistency across different disciplines and uh, working with particular institutions in particular ways. There are all sorts of expectations about how many degrees and what those degrees look like. And that has made certain things more rigid than they used to be. And that, I should add, also creates certain assumptions amongst students who are coming in. They do expect certain things to be like what they've heard about, and so they want to see those replicated again. In terms of the candidate population, we do see that there are many more international students, which is great for adding different perspectives. We also see more mature students. We see people who are upskilling in order to move into second careers. We see people who are doing degrees for fun after they've retired. Uh, we see all sorts of different kind of demographic changes, more women in many fields. We have people from different socioeconomic backgrounds. And all of these things are fantastic for providing an inclusive environment and exposing people to different ways of thinking and working, but they can pose challenges for supervisors as well because not everyone is aware of those differences and what the implications are and how those different sorts of people might approach the doctoral process differently. Study modes, as I mentioned, we do have a lot of people who are uh, doing degrees in order to upskill or for fun. We see a lot of work being done from afar, so we have distance students, and of course interactions are very different if it's through Skype or over the phone versus in person. Uh, we have a lot of people who are doing part-time degrees, and in fact now we have all different types of part-time. So you might not just be 0.5, but you might be 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and so on. And so there are very different timelines for people and very different progress rates as well. And all of this, again, fits in with the 
diversification of study purposes, we also do see an increasing number of students who know from the start that they won't go into academia. And this is not just because we know that there's quite a lot of pressure to get into any academic job, but actually because people never intend to do that to begin with. They would like the PhD sort of knowledge to take into industry or to take into business. And so uh, they have come for very different reasons, just to learn about research or project management or how academia works, to take that knowledge elsewhere. So you just need to think about that and how that might affect what people need to know and when they need to know it. So there are all sorts of supervisory styles that you can look at and think about in the literature. I've picked out a few here that I think are quite interesting and thought-provoking, and they can help people think about the different aspects of their own teaching and their own practice. So first up is one from Lee, and Lee proposed that there were basically five different supervisory um, goals. And one of these is functional, where you're just kind of helping someone to work on project management, so it's just the logistics of getting a project done. One is enculturation, so that's teaching someone what the discipline works like and how people think, and then drawing them into that discipline and getting them comfortable with that discipline. Critical thinking is another, and this tends to be something that almost all doctoral supervisors will identify as being very important. So this is helping a student to think about how they think, what's important, what is knowledge, how is knowledge come by, what makes a valid uh, way of drawing a conclusion. So this is quite philosophical in many ways. And this might not be something that you discuss explicitly, but it often comes out in terms of what themes you're emphasizing and how you address topics. Emancipation is another, so this is a bit more personal. So it's not just thinking about kind of critical thinking with respect to the discipline topics, but critically looking at yourself and thinking, what are the areas that I'm good at? What are the areas where I'm a bit weak? How can I develop that and become stronger? How can I feel independent and confident in my abilities? So this is kind of developing a whole person feeling expert and confident out in the world. And finally, we have relationship focus. And where I said that this one was very common, I can say that this one uh, is one of the least common whenever I talk with supervisors about what they feel they bring to a relationship. Many people are quite wary of being too uh, relationshipy with their students and too personal and too close. But actually, relationships can look very, very different. And the goal of this one here is to think about whether someone feels enthusiastic about their topic. Do they feel supported? Do they feel like they are capable of finishing that degree? Are they going to be able to take that degree out into the world and do something? So that might look like something that's quite personal, if that's the way that you are as a supervisor, but that also could be actually a bit more cut and dry, a bit more practical, and it really depends on the spin that you put on it. Most people are not one of these alone. Most people have one that's really prominent, often it is critical thinking, and then a couple others that maybe are close seconds or thirds. Very few people have all five. And the idea behind Lee's model here is that if you are aware of where you're kind of naturally drawn, then you can think about maybe supplementing these other aspects with the colleagues that you work with and the other members of the supervisory team that support the students or the other mentors that the student might interact with. So if you know where you're strong and where you're focused, you can ensure that these other areas, which are also important, are accommodated for and that the student isn't missing out on something that's quite important. Because all of these are aspects of making it through the doctoral journey in a way that feels uh, very comfortable and enriching and useful. The other thing to note is that with all of these, there are pros and cons. As I mentioned, you could fall into the trap of perhaps becoming a little bit too personal uh, and a little bit too close. If you're calling each other on weekends and late at night and you're talking about personal details, maybe that's not professional anymore, maybe that's not appropriate. So you don't want to do that sort of thing, but at the same time, you don't want to be so austere that your student is afraid to talk to you. So with all of these, it's about finding the right balance. Another interesting uh, supervisory style to think about is the fact that you're not just thinking about content and methodology, you're also supporting students in different ways. So no matter what style you might take or what issues you're going to focus on, there will be a certain amount of support in supervision. That's kind of what it's all about. So in some cases, it might be mentoring and developing, so kind of talking through how you did a thing or how you think 
they might run, uh, thinking about where a person is a bit weak and how they could bolster that, what development they might need. Another is coaching, and coaching tends to be a little bit more personal, so it's perhaps walking through issues a bit more step by step, it's a bit more esteem building, so it's not necessarily just the cut and dry things you need in your CV, but also more about that personal confidence. There is facilitating and monitoring, so that is perhaps actively going out and thinking about opportunities. So if you know that someone wants to get a bit more experience with public speaking, you might go out and arrange something for them and set it up and then say, here you go, you're invited to do that public talk and now you can get that experience. Or you might suggest to them, that is the thing that you need, here is this contact I have, why don't you go out and have a chat about that. And then you can see how they progress and then set up more of those opportunities if needed. So that's perhaps something where you are opening up doors a bit more actively. And I would say that that definitely culminates with the idea of sponsoring. So sponsoring is where you're actively going out and advocating for someone. So if you are in a meeting where people are talking about who might we want to hire for that or who should we offer this opportunity to, where do we spend this pot of money, you might say, right, I know a really good student who deserves that opportunity. Um, can we bring them in? Can we give them the first shot at this? How about we take that money and use it for developmental trips that that person this person's really good, I think you should offer them a job if you have a, a place in your lab group. So it's that sort of thing where it's a lot more actively suggesting and putting a person forward for something. And different supervisors might do some of these, all of these, you might do them at different times, but it's just important to think about how each of these is a component that you could be pulling into your supervisory activity. The Gatfield and Taylor model is a really interesting one because it thinks about not just what um, the, the supervisor does, but kind of how they do that and how that can be perceived by the student. And they balance out the structure, how much structure you put in your support and how much support that you give. So if you have a low level of support and a low level of structure, you just kind of do your supervision ad hoc on the fly, that can seem quite laissez-faire. And for some students that might be terrifying because they feel that they have no direction. Or if you have someone that's very independent, actually that might be what they prefer. If you have low structure but really high support, that's perhaps something that's a bit more of a pastoral relationship. That's where you're thinking a bit more about um, caring for someone. And you do that in a responsive way, so it's not structured, it's not you do it at these set times, it's whenever they need it, you're giving them a lot of support. And that can be quite a personal thing, which again, could be better or worse depending on who you're working with. When you have low support but high structure, that can come across as being very directorial. And a lot of people can feel comfortable with this, especially when they don't know what they're doing. So they would like to have a really clear understanding of exactly what needs to happen when. But other people might feel that that's very micromanaging. And so you do have to be quite careful. And this is especially true when you move into the high structure and high support range, when basically you're an interventionalist and you're preventing someone from having any autonomy and you're effectively doing everything for them. And this can be quite dangerous because it can prevent learning from taking place. Now, if someone's in a really bad spot, so they've really been faltering, they're not progressing, perhaps that could be useful, but it could also hinder people. So it's just being aware of that and choosing wisely. And I think that graph goes really nicely with this one because here we see a model where you're thinking about uh, the, the style that you've most recently been using and where the student is. And what this is thinking about is the fact that actually with a particular student, you're unlikely to need one style the whole way through. Often you have cycles and you should be aware of where the student is and what they're thinking and what they're doing and then adapt and respond accordingly. And this is where it starts to be really important to be aware of different supervisory styles, different modes of, of working, because you do need to be able to draw on different strengths and have different sorts of activities and responses. So for example, you might start off quite hands-on and that's perhaps when the student is more dependent when they're earlier on or maybe after they've hit that a second year slump and they need a bit more help. And so here you're going to be giving a whole lot of support to help people. 
But if you are continuing to be hands-on when the student has moved on a bit and they've become more autonomous, more um, aware of their own discipline, aware of what they need to do, then this is going to be setting up a potential for conflict between you two. If you are very hands-off at a time when a student is dependent, then actually that might seem quite neglectful, and it might be benign neglect because you don't need to do that, but it also could be seen as actually quite um, aggressive neglect in a sense if, you've com if the student has communicated to you that they do need help and you continue to not uh, provide support in that way. And I think the, the ideal is that you're moving to a phase where you can be hands-off because the student is autonomous. And that's really the growth that you want to see over the course of a doctoral degree. Maybe you'll have students who start here, which is fantastic, but often you tend to start here and then move up here. And you have this autonomy generation where you respond according to how much support they need, you back off as they no longer need it, and then they're here ready to fly free when they graduate. But the point is that often it isn't just this one linear trajectory. You have people that start moving up here, they have the sophomore slump down here, or they, they're moving along, things are going well, and then suddenly there's a setback in the research and their confidence is busted or their methodologies have to be rethought. And so you might cycle through and find yourself all over the graph before you can eventually move to this direction, which is hopefully where someone is at the time of FIVA. The idea behind all of these is that you don't have to pick any of these specific tasks. You don't have to do them at set times. You don't have to know what they're called. You just have to be aware that all of these are out there. They all can be useful at different times with different students. And you just have to be aware of that whole context in which a degree is being completed. Who's doing it? What else is going on in their life? How the work is progressing? Uh, whether they're staying on track with things? And so you just have to be flexible and have a repertoire of styles that you can draw on so that you can respond according to whatever is happening. And that is going to be a balance of what suits you. If you're not a super emotional person, that's fine. That's just how you are. You never are going to feel really comfortable with pastoral issues. So you can send someone to the pastoral tutor to supplement. So just think about where your absolute boundaries are. You have to know what suits your student. And again, you have to think about all of these changes that we have to the student population and be aware that what students students a few years ago may not be the case anymore because we do have very different students with different needs and different expectations. You have to think about your research arrangements and I think this one's quite important when you realize just how many partners we have with industry, how many different funding bodies we have, how many different buildings we have on campuses. All of these things can impact what is the research arrangement and, and what works best in that context. You have to keep in mind the rest of the supervisory team and how are they going to work and supplement and how will you all work together and be on track together and what suits the stage of the PhD. So just continually be evaluating all of this so that you can respond and be as helpful as possible when you're supervising your students.